Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Sometimes you've just got to appreciate the reason to fight. And you know, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion, because... That's just how we do it over here, and uh, if you'd like to subscribe to our podcast, and we certainly hope that you do, you are listening after all, uh, you can do that wherever your podcasts are found, places like Amazon, places like Spotify, Apple, and you can find all of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel. Also, we'd love it if you'd follow us on social media, either at its at In The Seats or at its Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates, and finally... And most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest movie news, reviews, and anything else in between that we can think of. we got a hard-working team who loves talking about the moving image, and we hope you like reading about it, and that's, <laughs> that's why we do it. But on this episode, speaking of bullets, we're going to be talking with writer director Tom Patton about his new film, 400 Bullets, which is on VOD now. It is really a uh, an edge-of-your-seat little action thriller that sort of puts you into the mindset of having a reason to fight. Because we see more movies where they're not necessarily invested, but the characters in this film really have some emotional investments to why they have to fight. And there's some great action sequences in it as well. And we talk with the uh, writer director Tom Patton and it's uh we ask about his inspiration for the film and sort of doing low budget action but still making it look effective and how we got started and all sorts of fun stuff uh in between. But uh that's enough of me. Let's talk to Tom because it was a good talk and I hope you enjoy it. Go. <laughs> First off, I just want to thank you so much for the time today, man. I appreciate it. My, my, my pleasure, man. Thank you for doing it. Now, I mean, obviously, congrats on the film, man. I dug it Thanks. because, I mean, it really felt like a bit of a hybrid between sort of more of the high-octane action-y stuff that we've been getting in, like, the 90s and the 2000s versus some of the more grittier, like, war movies that we got in, like, the 80s. Like, it almost felt like, you know, one of those kind of films. Like, I was, like, evoking, you know, Michigan Missing in Action or yeah. <laughs> Valor for some reason when I watched it. Well, like, I'm glad you got that tone because that's what I was going for. <laughs> walk me through the inspiration for the story. Well, I mean, it was my sixth feature film and, you know, I've made no, uh, you know, no secrets throughout my career. I'm sort of, um, I'm a big lover of the, the sort of B-movie genres, you know, I've, I've been through my 80s phase as a filmmaker and, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who really grew up on those sort of like mid uh, 90s through to early 2000s blockbuster action right. flicks, you know, that's what I loved. And, um you know, this felt like, uh, you know, a perfect opportunity for me to step away from sci-fi and horror. Uh, and you know which is where I'd been sort of primarily playing for the last you know five years and uh you know and I really wanted to do something that I thought you know what kind of movie do I want to watch on a Friday night with a few beers and um you know and that's kind of how this came about and I'd always sort of been interested in the Gurkhas as a you know as a culture and particularly as a fighting force you know here in the UK they're you know very famous and in terms of their their, their combat skills and no one's ever really tackled the subject matter. Um, so we went and spoke to a load of those guys, you know, and just said to them, you know, what kind of movie do you would you like to see about a, a Gurkha? And the, the answer seemed to be the same across the board. They were all like they wanted their own Rambo. So that was kind of the approach that I took when I was writing the thing. You know, it was like, let's make something that, you know, the Gurkhas are going to enjoy and feel, you know, like, oh, that's how we want to be seen, uh, right. you know. As, and uh, And at the same time, you know, it kind of snuck in a few of the issues they have in terms of, you know, pension rights and getting the same rights as British soldiers here in the UK. So, you know, we kind of tried to put that under the hood, but primarily make a film that was entertaining and, uh, you know, kind of tick the buttons, the boxes that they wanted to see and that I also wanted to see as a filmmaker. So that's kind of where it where it came from, really. And, um, you know, from, an, from a thematic perspective, you know, I was really interested. I was, I'm in this strange place career-wise where, you know, at the time I was being offered a bunch of studio reboots for a lot more money than this would have been. And 
then also this option to stay with the indie crew that have been loyal to me this whole time. And so I felt this sort of like tug of war as a writer. And I think that made its way into the script as well in terms of Rana's tug of war between, you know, going after the gold and uh, and then doing the doing the honourable thing. So, yeah, it was sort of like a collision of two things going on at once, really. No, that's wild, man. And I mean, it, it, like you say, I, it really is one of those films that, it, like, well, it has a bit of a straight line. It's trying to do a little bit more. And I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of curious because like you say, your other films had been sci-fi horror. Yeah. How much of an extra challenge was it to sort of play it straight and play it true to sort of, like you say, the Gurkhas and sort of be faithful to that culture and those those people? Yeah, I mean, it's it's strange, right? Because I think if you look at my filmography, you know, although I've kind of been pegged as I, well, I make genre films, the reality is I kind of make survival movies. You right. know, I sort, I'm sort of attracted to this idea of, you know, uh, people thrust into a situation in one night or a couple of days and, and trying to, ha- you know, having to survive it because I think that, you know, it's sort of in, it's those situations where people really reveal themselves and um, that makes it interesting as a writer. And so, you know, when I approached this, I kind of, I kind of came at it with that same mentality. It was just, okay, but we can't rely on world building here and, and all that sort of stuff that I'd kind of maybe leaned, leaned on maybe too much in other films, to be honest. And I think what makes 400 Bullets work is that, well, we all know what soldiers do and we all know about Afghanistan. So you can kind of just drop into it and, and get going. And, uh, yeah. you know, I found, I found that really freeing as a writer to be like, well, I don't have to set anything up here. You know, we can just, we can just sort of get going. And, and that was really, really interesting for me as a filmmaker. Well, and I mean, there is one thing that I have to thank you for as a fan, because I mean, especially at the independent level, when we see genre movies and we'll see like war movies, action movies, you can always tell the point where they kind of run out of money and there's a, a <laughs> like a terrible effect shot or two. And we did not have that in this film. Can you walk <laughs> through sort of being very conscious of staging sort of realistic action and not being overly reliant on any visual effect shots? Well, okay, so here's an interesting fact that, you know, we haven't really made a big deal about, but, you know, obviously we're an independent production and um, my background is as a CGI artist, uh, you know, and so I I ended up doing all the, I think there's about 600 VFX shots in the film and they're all, well, we had an entire team and then the world went into lockdown and so I was forced with this situation where it was like, okay, do we delay delivery of the movie or do I pull up my sleeves and, and get out my old, uh, you know, toy box of, of VFX? And so that's re- really complimentary to hear you say that because obviously it was a big, uh, it was a big worry of mine, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, look, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, the kinds of stuff, you know, what do you want to see in a movie? Like I, you know, there's, there's bits in the action sequences where the, you know, the choreographers, Darren and Spencer, who I've worked with on a few things now, you know, they'd show me these, uh these set pieces of design and they were great but you know but i just kind of felt like well actually it's better in this scene if we just see them holding the knife and his hands are bleeding because you know try to kind of inflict as much pain on the characters as i could yeah. and and let that speak for itself within the fight scene so it ended up in places where we take out entire segments of fighting and replace them with practical effects and you know slowed down moments and um you know, like I, said, I think that really harkens back just tr- wanting to try and recapture that sort of late 90s, early 2000s action vibe, you know, where they take the crew off to Thailand and they, they shoot for 16 days, which is funnily enough how long we had for this. It was tiny, tiny shoot. Um, you know, and just try to make the most of what you've got. And I think that that's really about knowing where to put the camera and trusting that your actors know what they're doing and how to stage the fight scenes and knowing when not to do a VFX shot because it might look ropey. Uh, and then knowing when you can get away with it as well. No, and I mean you're absolutely right because I mean when those odd, you know, looking VFX shots come in, they 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 take you out of the movie, and you never had that here. And I really did get the sense of the film was trying to do more with less, uh, which is really very much a sort of indie filmmaking spirit coda. I almost think. <laughs> well, I really appreciate that. I mean, one of the th- the big things for me was that you know once. Because we didn't, you know, we were shooting at night um, in the middle of England, actually. We were nowhere near Afghanistan. So all the mountains and stuff you see in the film are CGI composites, um, painstakingly done by myself. Um, But, you know, one of the things I was really, you know, that really bothers me is, 
when you don't see cases ejecting from the guns. Right. And so, and so I spent I spent weeks and weeks just you know making sure shells fired out of the, the guns. It was, <laughs> it was a nightmare, but it's nice to see that it's 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 kind of been picked up on. So thank you for that. Well, no, and I mean it, it goes a long way, and especially when you're trying to get invested in characters as well. And I mean, this film does have characters you get invested with. And I'm kind of curious because, I mean, you obviously, it, it does, at least for me, felt like you wanted to make a film about characters as opposed to about war. Like you wanted the characters yeah. to be forefront as opposed to just mounting a piece about spectacle. Yeah, I think I think that's important. I mean, look, you know, for me, the action films that always worked, you know, First Blood or or Die Hard, mm. you know, things like things like The Rock, you know, that, that, okay, yeah, it's, there's lots of spectacle going on, sure, and I and I didn't have the budget to get near that level of spectacle, but I, you know, you don't need budget to to get near that level of okay, well, I care about this character, and you know, and I think that it was really about trying to give Rana this this okay, well, let's give him something relatable that you know we've all. I think we're all experiencing right now to some degree because of the pandemic, bizarrely, although we shot this just before that happened. Um, you know, and that is, he's got money worries and it's something we can all, we can all equate to. And, you know, these bad guys show up and offer him a, a very tempting way out of those money worries. And it's like, okay, well, what kind of person do you want to be in that situation? And I think it's hopefully something that we can all, you know, we can all sort of tune into and ask ourselves, well, what would, what would I do in that situation? Well, I mean, it almost feels, I mean, unintentionally, of course, because you finish production and then everything happens and it almost feels like you have to become this this team of one to sort of yeah. get yourself through the night and get the movie done. Like how I like, it almost feels it almost feels like the timing is a little has a little bit of kismet to it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I mean, we wrapped production. Uh, I think it was the 21st of December 2019. Right. So we wrapped. Uh, and then we we did the first picture lock on it. And I was actually finishing picture lock on my previous movie, G-Lock, with Stephen Moyer at the time. And um, you know, it was one of these things where, you know, we, we were really proud of the film. And like all movies, we'd scheduled three to four days pickup time. You know, we had the budget for it. And it was not sure what we were going to use it for. Maybe we'll put some more action or something in. And then the world locks down. And it was like, okay, well... Well, we can't do that now. So let's let's hopefully you know see that we've got a movie that still functions and works. And, and I got really lucky that I think it does. Hopefully, <laughs> so. when you're putting when you're like when you're working on a project and you and you're putting it together, I'm I'm always kind of curious to ask this: How do you balance sort of sort of the creative need of the story that you want to tell versus what you get when what you want to get across versus sort of the elements of you know needing to be able to sell the movie? to be able to get funding, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, it always feels like it's a delicate dance to me. Yeah, and they really are, to be honest. I mean, I think there's... Um, the, the thing about the film industry is, you know, from an independent perspective, I mean, it's it's actually different in Canada and, and, and the US. In the yeah. UK, in the UK, uh, you know, when you make independent movies over here, you're kind of expected to make highbrow art house stuff, right. you know? Right, right. It's very frowned upon to, to 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 do what I do, which is go. Oh, I like action movies, you know, and I throw some spaceships in there and stuff, and uh, you know. So there's that balancing act of well, you know, trying to be respected as a filmmaker and and you know make stuff that you're proud of, but at the same time, you know, I think the one thing I've always done is I've tried to make movies with an audience in mind. You know, I've never, you know, I don't trust these directors that say, oh, I just make films for me. I think, well, you're a liar. Like we all. We all love the idea that people are going to enjoy the movie that we've made. And, you know, for me, that's that's important to me. You know, I, obviously, I feel I feel like a gut punch when everybody hates something that I've made. And it's right. it's nice when they react to it. And, um, you know, I think the, the thing I always try to focus on as a writer, you know, I look at my favorite movies and they're all like very thematically focused. You know, they'll have like one core thematic question and all the characters are a different argument about that question. You know, and every scene is is about that question and the ending tries to resolve the question. And so that's kind of what I've been hopefully honing over the last six movies and trying to get better and better at. And, you know, 400 Bullets is undoubtedly just about, you know, what, what does honour mean to you? Yeah, yeah. And every character is this argument about, you know, well, honour is I do it because, you know, it's the right thing to do or I do it because I'm in it for the money or, you know, and every character is kind of, pushing and pulling, uh, you know, on that argument. 
And really, we've got Rana in the middle who's being tugged in all these different directions as to what does it mean to him? Because he hasn't quite figured it out yet. Uh, you know, and then hopefully that pays off at the end of the film. And I think that when you take that approach to storytelling on an indie level, it becomes satisfying. You know, even yeah. if you, even if the scale isn't there and you didn't quite have the budget, you know, to go to town on it, the, the audience still feels like, well, that was worth my 90 minutes. You know, I got a, I got asked a, a question, we debated it and I got an answer and, you know, I feel satisfied with that. And so that's kind of what I try to do. And that's kind of the core of storytelling too. It's about letting us know about a person and sort of their their struggles and their sort of conflicts in life. And I'm kind of curious for for you. Think back to the younger years. Yeah is there a is there a moment or even like a movie in your life where you like it was the clear pivot where it's like okay, I got to do this now. This is my job for now, and I got to tell stories. Yeah, I mean, bizarrely, I'm actually 35, although I look about 12. So, <laughs> but um, my uh, I. I think it's funny because, I mean, a, a very formative thing for me was seeing Jurassic Park at the cinema, as I guess okay. a lot of mid 30 year old filmmakers have that experience. And um, but I thought I, I think I thought I was going to be an archaeologist until I was a teenager. And then I realized that that would be a terrible job. So <laughs> I think I think, you know, I kind of really started to get into the sort of the video nasty era. And I think Evil Dead 2 right. was a real turning point for me where, you know, I was just sort of. I saw somebody smashing genres together that didn't belong and making them work and, and all this, in, you know, in, you know, ingenious techniques for pulling something off. And uh, I just felt really inspired by it. And I think from there on out, I sort of was like, okay, I can do this. And then, um, you know, for a long time, I was making promos and adverts and stuff. And, and one day I saw Monsters by Gareth Edwards. Uh, he's actually from the town next door to where I come from with a very similar background and it, and it made me go, well, you know, if one guy proved you could do that, then maybe I can too. And so that was a real turning point for me where I sort of down tools on all the commercials and the music videos and, yeah. and, and set out to make my first film with, I think we, I think we spent like 50,000 pounds. So like, you know, like $70,000 on that first movie. And then it's really just been this escalating train since then. But yeah, you know, I, I think, I think every, every year I find something that makes me go, Oh, that's why I love making movies. Like, that's why I keep doing this, you know. Um, Mad Max Fury Road blew me away. And I think, you know, oh, that, yeah. that set a bar for the, for the rest of us to, to try and hit for, forever, which I doubt any of us will. But, you know, so I feel inspired by things like that for sure. No, we will we will forever run shiny in uh, shiny <laughs> Crow Fury Road, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm always kind of curious just to try to start putting a bow on this because, I mean, as an independent filmmaker, as a as a content creator, especially given the landscape that we're in where there's so many options and there's so much stuff coming out, like how do you sort of stay true to the vision? Is it just really focusing on the creative or is it sort of being cognizant of the world around you as you're trying to work on stuff? Yeah, I think it has to be being a bit of both, to be honest, you know, don't get me wrong. I'd love to, to sit here and tell you, oh, I'm just in it for the art. Right. But, you know, that's not that's not really my background. You know, I was, you know, I never went to college or university to study film. You know, I was like 20 years old and I just decided to start a film business. So for me, it was always, well, how am I going to pay my rent this month? Um, you know, so I've always been very actively engaged in the business side of things and, and trying to make stuff that that I think not only will I be proud of, but that will actually have a home and people will want to purchase as well. So those two things are always feeding each other for me as a filmmaker. But, you know, I actually think it's a good space to live in because, you know, sometimes you can be working on something and it, and it just doesn't work. You're just in it because right. you, and then you make that thing and you spend somebody's money on it and you get it all the way to the line and then it's, no one picks it up, you yeah. know, and, and that's, that's a, like the worst case scenario for a filmmaker to end up in. So I think, you know, having this sort of business acumen to, to the stuff that I do, it helps me, you know, course correct my slate and try and pick stuff that I think is relevant or will be relevant by the time it comes out, you know. And I had no idea how relevant the themes in 400 Bullets would be when we made that. But I also had this sense, you know, like a lot of people are just generally struggling in the world right now and there's a lot of wealth disparity. And yeah. I think we'd all, we'd all like to watch someone kick ass and, and get what they deserve for being a good person. And so that was kind of... The, the trail of thought from a business perspective in the story. And then, you know, I, you know, I come from a pretty 
poor place in the UK and I've kind of dragged myself up on my bootstraps. So in that sense, I felt like, well, I'm, I'm doing something I care about as well and trying to put a good message out there. No, and I mean, I think you have, especially with this film. And I mean, I think it's going to be one of those ones that really gets sort of uh, like a like a slow like slow build up and it gets a like it gets like a real following it's a bit of like a deep cut of in the action movie i think it has that quality and Thank i'm kind of curious from your perspective if you had to recommend a couple of maybe deep cut action movies that people wouldn't necessarily know straight away what would they be because we're oh, all that's... fans first in this business right yeah yeah of course that's a tough one because there's so many good ones out there i guess um you know, one of the one of the reasons I picked Jean Paul Lee for this was I I saw a film of him in called Night Shooters, you know, which kind of starts out like this sort of indie filmmaking comedy and then builds into this big action film. Um, and Jean Paul Lee was in it and and totally blew me away. And so that's how he ended up in this because I was like, well, let's do more of that. Um, <laughs> so I would definitely recommend Night Shooters. Um, what else is that? There's I mean, it's, it's funny because there's a bunch of stuff. Like there was those two Universal Soldier um, sequels that went straight to video. That were oh, yeah. Like, they were, no, those were solid. Yeah. the Pete, I think it was it Pete Hyman's son that did yeah, those. Yeah, they were. And, yeah. 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 And they're just really solid action films, you know, that kind of stick the landing and, and do what you want from them. I think there's a lot of talent out there. There's a guy called uh, Liam O'Donnell who does the Skyline movies. Right. right? Yeah. You know, and I think this guy is somebody to to really get behind and support because I think he's going to come out with something that, you know, we all like treasure in the years. No, I don't know what it is. Yet, surprisingly but. good. You're right, man. I mean, it's and you're right. There is such a there is such a breadth of talent out there and the technology yeah. is there for independent filmmakers to make action movies and make them good. And I think you've done that and then some. And I just want to say well, thank you. Thanks for the time, man. This was fun. And congrats again on the film. May I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. And thanks for all your kind words. All right. Cheers, Tom. Take care. All the best. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.